to welcome everyone sincerely to this special panel discussion, um, Drawing Upon Inequities. Uh, we are so excited to welcome you into this discussion. I'm Karen Trivett, I'm an Associate Professor and Head of Special Collections and College Archives at the Gladys Marcus Library's Unit of Special Collections. So, very happy to have you with us. And I just want to give you some housekeeping points before we get started to make this a very smooth operation. Please mute yourself when you're not talking so that it can free up the bandwidth uh, for visitors uh, to speak very freely. Um, also, I'll be monitoring our chat room uh, so that we can uh, relay questions as they come up, if it makes sense in the timing. Um, but we want to give as much time to the presenters as we can. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Christiana Rice, our moderator for the evening. Hello, everyone. Um, as Karen said, my name is Christiana Rice. Um, I am in my third year of a two-year degree, but that we're not going to talk about that part. Uh, currently, I'm studying um, museum conservatorship slash kind of uh, curation uh, in our at, at FIT. Sorry, I get tongue-tied a little bit. Um, and really, my focus uh, for the duration of my time here um, has been kind of inclusion and diversity and that kind of thing. Um, while I don't have a background in illustration or fashion illustration at all uh, myself, I do find it imperative to kind of uh, have these conversations and kind of help uh, structure uh, these conversations. Also, given what has been happening over the past six months, um, I feel we need to start having more open conversations because if it never gets out, um, we're kind of just going to get stuck in the same cycle over and over again. Um, and then our panelists, all of them do wonderful work. Um, if anybody hasn't had a chance to check out any of our panelists, all of their names are on our uh, flyer. Please go look at all of their work. Um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves because who else better knows them than themselves? So whoever would like to start, go ahead. Um, so we'll say, I'll just pick randomly. We'll start with Glenn. Glenn, I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Lamont, would you like to start introducing Sure, yourself? sure. Okay. Um, so uh, my name is Lamont O'Neill and, um, uh, I'm a fashion illustrator. I've been a fashion yeah. illustrator for you know, decades. I won't go into how many decades. Um, and um, very briefly, I went to the High School of Art and Design. I got a scholarship to Parsons School of Design. Um, I worked with some fabulous fashion illustrators um, who happened to be, you know, wonderful instructors. Um, I inter inter interned, excuse me, with Antonio Lopez. Um, and um, I've done just about everything in the field that um, an illustrator of my age at that time would have done. So retail, books, magazines, advertisements, um, ad agencies, um, just, just about everything. Um, and so, uh, I mean, when I was thinking about this subject, I thought it, this is an enormous subject to, to uh, you know, really huge. Because you're, you're really talking about the intersection of race and gender and class and consumption. And it, it, fashion illustration itself has only been regarded as a serious subject matter um, worthy of investigation only in the past 20 years. So, you know, I mean, kudos to you for suggesting this, but I mean, this is a heavy load. So, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll, I'll let my, my, my peers um, continue. Glenn, I think you were the one who. Yes, I um, thank you, Lamont. So good to see you as always and uh, always admiring the the work that you do. It's just so incredibly gorgeous. Right back at you. <laughs> um, I, like Lamont, I've had the experience of working in this um, field when it was a field that had um, a lot of importance in the world of fashion when people uh, use fashion illustration as their 
uh, primary source of, of uh, presentation. We were the, our styles and our way of presenting their uh, concepts was their, uh, was their way of being produced or, or um, viewed, okay? Uh, but I love, um, I love my experience in it. I started in the um, early 70s and, and still that was an edge of the heyday for fashion illustration. And uh, I kind of watched it change in its position to now a point where it's a being appreciated all over again for its uniqueness. It went from being ubiquitous to being um, unseen and now it's being rediscovered. And I think that uh, people of color in particular had a great opportunity to, uh, to work in the industry and not have our pigment be the um, part that's, that's for sale or that's on show. So in that way, uh, in some ways, it was a little easier to get your work out, but you still had to get through the front door. And that always was a challenge. And like Lamont, I'll leave this. We have a huge panel here. So I'll let the rest of you weigh in with your experience. Shireen? Oh, Shireen, Angelica, John Quo, any one of you could go next. Yeah, you have to, your mic is, is off. Jean-Quel, if you would like. I can talk. Hi, um, my name is Jean-Quel Pickney. I am a pop culture and plus size uh, fashion illustrator. I graduated from SCAS, I ran a college of art design. I majored in illustration and actually service design, but I entered into the textile design world later, which eventually led me to doing um, fashion illustration. Um, and because I am a plus size woman and I realized that there was a market for that, um, I eventually started uh, exercising, using my talent toward plus size illustration to kind of speak to a group of women that I felt like the industry wasn't really uh, speaking to. I've been lucky enough to work with um, Lane Bryant and Ashley Stewart and Bianco and other major plus size brands and work at different um, plus size events that are known like Kirby Con or Full Figure Fashion Week. Um, and I've been happy to spread the body positivity word out there. And I'm very, very happy to be a part of this um, panel. Excuse me if I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I guess then uh, we were both called at the same time, so I'll jump in. Um, so it is an honor and pleasure to be here tonight alongside uh, legends and trailblazers. Uh, I'm Shireen Solomon. I am a Muslim American. I'm an Egyptian American, Arab American. Uh, I am a single mother. I am an educator. I am an artist and I'm an advocate. Um, I have uh, my background in fashion design and I have another degree um, in leadership and arts education. And so all of these sort of as they intersect in terms of um, my own experience as a child of immigrants, uh, in terms of um, my experience as a, a Muslim woman in America, uh, as an artist, as a fashion practitioner for over 20 years experience working for so many different brands from so many different aspects of the industry. I also spent quite a lot of time, um, you know, sort of between beading and embroidery and surface design and silhouette and sort of looking at it holistically, not seeing myself represented. Um, at the time when I went to school, uh, I was told, and again, too, it's not so cute anymore. As Lamont said, it's not so cute to count the numbers anymore. We're just gonna skip over that. <laughs> we'll skip over that part. But back in the days, um, I also had the experience of being in a predominantly white institution. Uh, and I was told that my illustrations were too much. My colors were too garish. It was too much, too much hips, too much curves, not tall enough, not skinny enough. Uh, and so I kind of ended up, you know, for, for me, that led me in different directions in the fashion industry, but I was still connected to the industry. And only after so many years of understanding that 
fashion, as it represents a story, as it represents maybe a perception or a dream or a fantasy or an escape, but as it could also sort of, we're seeing that shift where now it's actually, you know, we're, we're turning it inward now and actually we can just be fabulous. We don't have to sort of have this aspirational image of the other um, as fabulous. And so coming back to, you know, through teaching, um, figure illustration, fashion illustration, uh, and coming back after such a long hiatus and I still go to draw and I'm still told my figures are not skinny enough and they're, <laughs> and, they're <so> <laughs> you know, and it was a, it was actually another um, woman actually for in the in the discourse and starting to join social media and starting to hear that discourse another um, a very lovely colleague as well from Parsons Laura Volbutesta yeah. woman who started um, saying this revolutionary thing that it was actually okay that you could actually, you know, draw fashion for it to be perceived as fashion and they can be real, they can have cellulite and they can be all different colors and you know, start to sort of celebrate just that realness, right? And so I think I'm coming into this perspective as someone who also does um, community workshops, advocate in the Muslim community and the Arab community, coming from a generation where the arts, I always say the arts wasn't on the menu that was offered to me when I was a student, right? It was teacher, doctor, lawyer, right? So you got that same menu. Um, and it was just this revolutionary act to sort of say, imagine if I go into the arts. Um, and so for me, for my generation, for younger women, for younger Muslim women, Arab women to see uh, one of us, we made it. Somehow she convinced her, how did she even convince her parents, right? So to sort of, you know, be a representation. So this, this panel for me, representation, I'm looking at it not only from the representation of the practitioners in the field, but also the content of what are we representing. Um, and so there's so much, and then that's why I think, yeah, there's so many layers and nuance, um, you know, that, that we'll have to try to get through. And I'm the first one to put it out there. I'm gonna take credit. Um, I hear a podcast, the same. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. So I'm gonna toss it to, Let's see who's the next person to speak. Maybe you guys, I, I'm, I have different boxes up on my screen, so I'll let. We also have a couple of people who just kind of came in um, yeah. towards the background. Veronica's here, Josh Jot is here, Angelica's here. So whichever one of you want to start speaking first, go ahead. I could go next. Uh, hi, I'm Josh Jot Singh Hans. I grew up in Delhi in India uh, and moved to Baltimore about five and a half years ago. Um, there I studied animation. I always wanted to study animation. Um, and I think I was always fascinated by clothes and people. And I think that fascination with people and creating characters is what led me to animation. But when I was actually studying it halfway through, I was like, I don't think I want to do this. Um, so once I, once I graduated, I still finished my uh, animation degree and continued pursuing fashion. I was just drawing and putting it out. Um, and then I ended up working with a couple of fashion houses in India. Um, but I came in from like a completely non, haven't, haven't had studied fashion at all. I came at it from a very outside perspective, uh, which always kind of made me feel really alienated from the field. Um, but I was also glad that I could contribute something different to it. Um, then I moved to Baltimore uh, and I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art for an MFA in illustration. Um, and I think my fascination with fashion continues regardless of how lucrative it's been over the past decade for me personally. Um, but it's something that fascinates me and I wanna keep uh, creating fashion illustration and talking about body positivity, talking about Sikhs, their representation, especially in the United States um, in a post 9-11 strange uh, climate, which is something that people uh, who are Sikh and are in this country still struggle with. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of my point of view uh, into drawing fashion. Thank you. Uh, who's next? We have a couple who haven't introduced themselves. Yet. I'll go. Um, hi everyone, I'm Veronica Miller Jamison. I'm based in Philly. And you have to excuse me, the, ner the heart is pumping because this panel is like a powerhouse, um, just from the introduction itself. So it's really exciting to be here. Um, I, uh, I guess like many of us, I've always had an interest in fashion and in drawing and been doing it since I was a young kid. Um, but I came to this career as a career change. I worked in broadcast news um, for about eight to 10 years before I decided to go back to school for my degree in fashion design. So I went to Drexel University in um, Philadelphia, 
got my degree in fashion design. Um, obviously, the illustration courses were my absolute favorite. And when I graduated, I was like, I don't want to sew anything ever again. Like, <laughs> no muslins, no pattern making, like none of that ever again. So um, I started freelance illustration. Um, my work, my illustration work uh, focuses on putting black women in a fashionable context and also the context of joy. Um, and so um, uh, Glenn and Lamont were talking about the golden age of fashion illustration, which I studied in school, which was amazing to me. But by the time I got out of school and had my degree, those opportunities weren't really there anymore. And so I used my fashion illustration to get into doing work with like licensing and stationery and commissions and things like that. Um, so I've worked with Hallmark. I've done Bloomingdale's. Um, I was doing live sketching at a point for events in Philly and New York, which obviously you really can't do much of anymore. Um, and also started teaching fashion illustration. Now I work primarily as a textile designer here in Philly. Um, and I still do my personal illustration on the side. And I've also um, got into picture book illustration. Um, so fashion illustration was really um, formative for me and studying the art and studying what's important in it was really formative for me. And I take that, all those things I've learned into textile design and into children's book illustration, which is really fun to do. So the fun thing about um, the book I last illustrated, which, which came out last year, um, was called A Computer Called Catherine. It's about Catherine Johnson, the human computer that helped uh, you know America get on the moon. And part of that was like, well, what were they wearing? You know, and my editor was kind of surprised that I was such a nerd about getting the details of <laughs> the clothing and the costume just right. And it was like, well, that's where I came from. So um, I'm really excited to be here. Still a little nervous, but I'm really excited for this uh, conversation. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> I, I do believe we have one more, one or two more, right? I could go now. Yes. Um, I'm Angelica. I am English, and but I live in New York. And my mum was a fashion designer when I was younger, which I think I always found fashion to be quite, um, you know, inaccessible in a way, um, because it was it was kind of like this thing that was, oh, like I, I am not, I, you know, I, I find it difficult to relate to it. I'm also really nervous. I never do this, I'm sweaty, but it's okay. Um, and uh, I basically, I always kind of found a way to cope with, I guess, like feeling like, ooh, this is, you know, kind of like fashion um, through humor. And so I basically just uh, apply, I was, I was very into, when I was younger, like cautionary tales, and Hilaire Belloc had like a book of cautionary tales that was illustrated by I should know, um, being an illustrator. But uh, and uh, it um, it just made me laugh, and it made me realize that, that like a way to communicate through illustration is also through humor. So I kind of enjoyed doing. Um, I was studying for a degree that I wasn't very into, and I got very into illustration and I realized and I think I'd never wanted to pursue it because I felt like you know as one can often feel like you know you're, you're not the best person at drawing in the class you're not you know kind of told you know and, and so that kind of insecurity which just like it just made it made me kind of like well I can't you know I, I have no confidence in drawing and both of my parents being creative made it a bit more difficult and um, anyway so I found that engaging with fashion through illustration that had a satirical twist was I enjoyed the way it made fashion accessible it, it appeared to like make fashion accessible for so many more people because it, like you, someone might not you know understand a uh, couture piece but if you engage like in the same way that if I don't know I just I, I feel like humor can kind of bring people together and I but, you know light humor and I wish I had a Good. Well, so for example, the um, to, to, to literally to take the words and to kind of do the literal interpretation of them, like visually, I just I, I enjoyed that, and it made me realize that you know I'm engaging with fashion in that way. Fashion is amazing. It's so it's really an incredible, incredible thing, and I wanted more people to kind of not dismiss it because they didn't understand it, but to kind of to 
find this way to like, you know, communicate to also my peers who, you know, would kind of be like, oh, but fashion is so stupid, which is always such an annoying kind of thing because fashion is the such an art and it's a wearable art. And it's, and this, yeah. So that, that, so that's <laughs> much too nervous to introduce myself. But so I do satirical fashion illustration. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, have we uh, missed anybody? I think everybody's gotten the chance to introduce themselves. Just let me know really quickly. I think we're okay. Ronaldo. Okay. Oh, hi. Where is he? Hi. Um, my name's oh, Ronaldo Barnetti. Hi. Um, I am a primarily I'm a fashion designer, and. Um, I was really thrilled and excited to hear about this. I didn't know we all got a chance to speak. I just thought it was a panel thing. So, but anyway, um, I am primarily trained as a fashion designer. I always say I'm a fashion designer who I guess kind of draws well enough to illustrate sometimes. <laughs> so um, Glenn Tunstall, and I always tell him this, I probably wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for Glenn Tunstall because I'd probably be somewhere in Fayetteville, North Carolina, crying my eyes out, wishing I was in New York. But uh, Glenn Tunstall, I was here. I had left New York and then I came back to visit and look, looked for a job. I was freelancing at Polo. The freelance was over and I was going to have to go back to North Carolina. And then a friend of mine said he knew a guy that was an artist that was Glenn Tunstall. I thought Glenn Tunstall was a white lady. And I found out that Glenn Tunstall was this black dude that lived in New York and in this place called Brooklyn. And um, so I took the subway to this place called Brooklyn and met Glenn Tunstall. And he told me that uh, he needed uh, some help with this illustrations and he said oh i can only pay you x amount of dollars and i was like wow but i was very cool and went oh yeah i think i can do it for that <laughs> and um so that was uh my intro to glenn tunstall and before that i actually i didn't know him but i had taken lamont o'neill's place at a job where he was had been working, uh, he had been on vacation, and I interviewed at this place called Toby Report, and they showed me these amazing illustrations, and they said, "Can you draw like this guy?" And I lied and said, "Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> why not?" And and they they actually believed me and kept me for two weeks, and um, so uh, yeah, then I kind of went on, you know designing and um i met a guy by the name of patrick kelly and then i went to paris for a little while and helped him out and then i came back to new york and worked at vogue patterns and then started designing at ann klein and then back to ralph lauren and then nicole miller and this and that and i teach at fit now and i'm also working on my own comic book right now it's a fashion comic book which is kind of full circle because that's the way i started uh i swear i got into fashion was through comic books like millie the model and betty and veronica and patsy walker and they had kids that would draw the you know the paper dolls and you know they'd send in the clothes and they'd mention the kids like this dress was designed by little glenn tunstall he's 10 years old you know and that's <laughs> I, I, I love fashion like that. Like I always watch movies where fashion is the good guy. Like in Funny Face, fashion is the good guy, you know? Like Devil Wears Prada, fashion's the bad guy. And I didn't like that. I like when fashion's the good guy. I like when, you know, the girl gets discovered, the homely skinny girl gets discovered and voila, she's a fierce model. I like all that stuff. That's just the way I grew up, you know? But anyway, that's me. Oh, I teach at FIT now too. Yeah, so. <laughs> so sorry. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you. You're uh, that was wonderful. Thank you all for the wonderful introductions. Um, we um, kind of tried to do it myself. Oh, yes. Hi. Okay. Hi. I'll be quick. Um, hi. I'm Ashley Simpson. I'm a student at FIT in the fashion design program and the associate's degree. 
Um, this is like my first panel with like a whole bunch of adults who have so much experience. So I'm like a student, I'm ready to learn from all of you. Um, my experience with fashion illustration has been really interesting because that was like, I'm like, this is the only way I'm getting into FIT. I just have to draw my butt off and put some things together and hopefully they let me in. And um, that was like how I got in and um, fashion illustration has helped me make my friends interested in fashion because I kind of just drew them in the stuff they wanted to see. And like even myself, if I couldn't like pay for the clothes, I would just be like, okay, let me see how this will look on me. Let me just draw it on a model that looks like me. So that has been a way for me to just visually see where I wanna be. So um, yeah, I hope to just learn more from you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, so um, since there are so many wonderful voices, um, we're gonna kind of limit it. I sent you a long list of questions <laughs> that we wanted to try to get through. But um, as I've said a little later, we're probably going to try to make it down to four. Um, I want to give enough time for everybody to speak their piece. If we get to three, that's great. We'll leave some time at the end um, if any of the audience wants to ask any questions. So let's just start. Um, first, it's kind of a loaded question, um, which, I mean, this is a loaded conversation, so I digress. Um, what is it like working within a space? Uh, where traditionally white males have been uh, more revered. And I know, um, Glenn, you were speaking on it a little bit earlier, how um, at a certain point, because you were behind the pencil, uh, more or less, you didn't really, it didn't really matter what you looked like, but just kind of what was it like working in these kinds of spaces traditionally? Well, I, well, um... I was really fortunate early on to get a really great job as a staff illustrator at Women's Wear Daily. And as a result, my work wound up in the industry. People saw it every day. They saw my name, but they didn't see my face. And I was at that time aware enough that um, my face wasn't going to help me get into any doors. In fact, they literally, literally the doors were closed on my face. Uh, one of the things I had to do for women's wear was go into the market, as they say, and interview um, designers and manufacturers about their current collections and look at the clothes and do illustrations of them. And I would get to these locations uh, and the receptionist or the doorman would insist that I go to the messenger's entrance mm -hmm. because I was not... Uh, perceived as someone who had viable business in that um, building. And so it was very distressing and I always still had to go it was my job. And it was a matter of how I felt that day, whether I was going to fight them and, and have somebody from the company come down and bring me up the elevator or just give in and go around the corner to the uh, messenger's entrance. So I knew that this was a um, if this wasn't a uh, world that I would survive in just on my own. So I got an agent, and from that point on, my agent, a white guy, wonderful Barney Kane, uh, took my work and exposed it to everybody that uh, was important. And they didn't get to know me, and I didn't get to know them as much until like later when the job became really busy and I had to interface with them. But that was my way around um, dealing with that. And, you know, this is the early 70s, mid 70s. So we're still coming off of, you know, um, you, you know, the civil rights and all of the fights for that. And I mean, even at Women's Wear, one day I came in, came in and I had been absent the day before and they were like, where were you? And I was like, I was sick. And they were like, oh, well, you know, the folks from the government was here, you know, and I guess I was supposed to be there available to, you know, let them know that they've integrated their department. Uh, but I missed it. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's still, the point I do want to make, though, is our talent is immense. And our ability to do anything that's been put in front of us is immense. And when people see that they, that you, they can hand you something and you can handle it, 
they soon forget what you look like because they're more concerned with what you can do. So that's that's it. Um, is it okay if I jump in here? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, when I was a senior in high school, high school of art and design, um, I wandered into this class and it was a fashion illustration class and I wasn't supposed to be there. I had another class that I was supposed to take, but the instructor said, you know, stay in the class, we'll deal with it later. And I started drawing. And then he came behind me and he said, I think you should stay in this class. And I stayed. Later on in the semester, he came to me with an illustration um, and he showed it to me. And it was by Glenn Tunstall, Women's Wear Daily. And he said, this guy is a black fashion illustrator. So you can do this too. So I, Glenn's always embarrassed when I tell this story, but he really is the beginning of it really. Um, there are other fashion illustrators of, of, of color who, who, you know, Ty Wilson, Harvey Boyd. Harvey Boyd was, you know, one of our peers, um, you know, who's, who's since passed away. There, there, there are others, to be sure. Um, but, you know, Glenn was really the first. Um, and, and like all firsts, he, when he opened up the door, others were able to follow. Um, I was very lucky. Um, in several ways. Once uh, I got a scholarship to Parsons, um, in my senior year, I was an intern um, at Antonio's um, for about a week or so, and then at Bonwood Teller. Bonwood Teller is like Saks Fifth Avenue. It's gone now, but it's sort of like that. Saks Fifth Avenue, Bergdorf Goodman, very high school. I was there for two years, and then um, I left. Uh, I was given this fabulous job at Franklin Simon, again, no longer exists. Um, and I was there as an illustrator and an art director. And uh, for most of my early, and we're talking about at this point, I was about 23. But just before that, I, I was aware um, of, you know, being black in a, in a wider white world. How, how could you not? And we all developed ways of dealing with that, both offensively and defensively you know, ignore it, accept it, fight it, move on. It's just a social, a way of, 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 of finding your way professionally because you're, you're aware that you have this professional persona and that you're dealing with a stereotype. So you're gonna be confronted with that. So you're almost, you're almost armored for that. So anyway, um, I took this job, I was doing it happily. And in one sense, one, one case, I was given a raincoat to draw. It was a white raincoat, really rather bland. And it uh, was just, it had some pleats in the back. And um, this was at Franklin Simon. And it was really, really boring. And graphically, I knew that it had to have a black woman wearing it because I wanted darker skin. And I wanted some contrast with a larger white raincoat. And because it was boring in the front, I had her looking over the shoulder. And the hair was in a chignon. So think Naomi Sims, uh, you know, Diana Ross, um, um, Iman, very, you know, this is, you know, late seventies, early eighties. So I'm very happy with it. I send it in, I proof it, the ad goes off. The next day I come in and the creative director, a, a really nice woman, red in the face. She's absolutely red in the face. And she's looking at me as I'm coming into the office and I'm thinking, I'm 23, I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? What happened? Oh my God. You know, this is a, you know, this is a great job, probably the best job I'll ever have. I've screwed it up. Oh my God, what am I going to do? And she says, I'm really sorry. And I go, what's wrong? And she goes, and she's red and she doesn't want to tell me. She actually stutters. And she says, you drew a black model and she has to be white. And, and it was, a, I mean, it was like a small bomb went off. And I'm standing there, you know, black guy, she's standing there, a white woman, and she's telling me that this image that I created for the, is wrong, bad. So even though I had power, I didn't have much power. And so I said, okay, okay, I'll change, I'll change the illustration. Um, and, I, and she was like, I'm really, really sorry. This has nothing to do with me. Your work is fabulous, blah, blah, blah. Now, the ironic part about this was that the ad was supposed to be shown in a newspaper in Washington, D.C., affectionately known as Chocolate City, you know? But they had decided 
that they did not want this customer. They didn't want this image and they didn't want that customer. And so the idea, um, and, and I don't think we can get into it a lot because we've only got an hour and a half, is that commercial art is about selling something. And unlike fine art, which is a personal ex expression of, of whatever's in your head and in your heart, you know, um, commercial art has to persuade. It, it, it has to provoke. But at the same time, it's dealing with imagery that everyone can accept, okay? Too far out of what they consider the mainstream and they will not accept it. So, the, so, so one of the difficulties of being a, a black artist uh, in, in the fashion world is trying to find out how do I say what I wanna say? How do I say what I need to say? While at the same time being accepted so that it is published because that's the end result of all commercial art, that it be published. I think it's getting better now, but I can tell you through the years, and you can talk to Ronaldo, you can talk to Glenn, but it has been a fight. It has been a fight. And we're just talking about color. We're not talking about gender. We're not talking about body size. We're not, we're just talking about, so, so I, I, when I said before that this is a gargantuan field of study, it truly is, it truly is. So anyway, I'll stop and go on. Christiana, can I jump in? Hi, first of all, my heart again is still beating because <laughs> from the stories and the experience here. And I have to say, as a little black girl who was growing up in Pittsburgh, drawing all the time, Glenn, Lamont, I was like looking for you. Like my heart has been looking for y'all for my whole life. Ronaldo, I've, I've been following you forever. Um, I have been, <laughs> I have been, I, I have been looking for y'all forever to um, validate the work I've been doing. And like we talked about before, the environment is different now. So like when I was coming into illustration, there wasn't the staff jobs, right? Um, the advertising jobs like that. So I had to make a different way. And so I just wanted to say that to you guys because I'm literally on the verge of tears thinking about it. Uh -huh. um, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll get it together. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, there, I've been looking for you and I have, tons of books on this subject because I've studied it for a long time and I've been searching for you guys for so long. So I want to say that to thank you for what you've done and what you've endured and for sharing all of this with us today. I really do. Um, I have a similar story to Lamont's is not in um, the realm of fashion because like I said, I had to take my fashion illustration, illustration work elsewhere um, and to licensing and stationery. Um, so I had the opportunity to design um, Christmas cards with a licensing client. They wanted to diversify um, their Christmas card offerings. And um, the power of a Christmas card is crazy when you put a black woman on it. I got to say that because uh, it doesn't exist. And um, the same way I said I've been looking for you guys, there is a history of black commercial art right, on all sorts of products mm -hmm. that we just don't learn and that history is kind of severed off from us. Um, so having this discussion and talking about those things is like really important. But when I had this licensing deal, I got on the call with, I think like the president of the company, which was really interesting that he wanted to talk to me. Usually it's just an art director. And what he said to me was basically along the lines of, yeah, we love your work, really excited about this. Honestly, we don't think it's going to sell a whole lot, but it's going to make us look good. Yeah. So put, you know, and so from the jump, I'm battling with, I'm excited for this opportunity, right? To put something that I love to do in stores, representing black women, putting them on products where they're not usually seen, but also carrying that in the back of my head where it wasn't, I was useful. My art was useful to an end goal um, and only useful up to a point, right? And so what do you do with that, right? Um, so what I did was tell everybody I could go find these cards every place you could and buy all of them if you can. Yeah. Right? <laughs> 
right? Yeah. Take the money and run. Yeah. yeah. Take the money and run. Um, and my friends were like doing that and putting all the cards in front and blocking all the other cards out in the stores, just, you know, <laughs> guerrilla warfare in uh, department stores. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting because, because um, the environment is different and now I don't have an office to go into to go look for an illustration job. I'm kind of piecing these things together. I'm finding all these experiences where I'm useful. I'm tokenized. I'm going to make somebody look good for a limited amount of time. And when my talent and my artwork has outlived that usefulness, they don't need me anymore. So caring that is really difficult. Um, it's also uh, informed my effort to um, make my art more permanent through publishing, through books, because books last, they live, mm -hmm. and also finding ways to offer it um, products and art and stuff on my own to the world. But it's a, ch it's a challenge that I think a lot of other people don't have to do. Um, because when I was starting in illustration, we, I was starting in the era where there was the rise of the fashion illustration blogs, right? And all these girls from New York and the East Coast were putting out, you know, these illustrations on the blogs and they were getting um, collaborations and being flown around the world and, you know, doing products for different companies, but still not being read as legible because of the kind of artwork I've put out because my figures had brown skin and hips and lips, right? So it it's an interesting thing, like carrying the importance of the, the representation and knowing that it's important, but also being careful of not being tokenized at the same time. Sometimes those things are really hard to hold together. Thank you for all of that. <laughs> Because that, you all said a mouthful. Um, does Really quickly, before we go to the second question, does anybody else have anything to say? I think um, is... Okay. Oh, I can't hear her, but. Yeah, you're, 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 you're. Okay. Sorry, I'm a Zoom queen. I'm not a Google Meet, so I'm still a little. Okay. Um, you know, I wanted to just respond when I was saying earlier about the, the two um, aspects of the lack of representation. And so one of the things that I was saying is, you know, when we have that lack of representation of practitioners in the field, you know, the fact that Veronica just really literally choked up to even see that there were other black artists, black illustrators, image making, like that already, that visceral connection to understand. If we don't see it, maybe we don't even consider that it's possible. Mm -hmm. But then to just have that, that, you know, that opening for possibility. But I also want to kind of lend, you know, take this to another direction too, when you were talking about the black Christmas cards and the white Christmas cards and the black Christmas cards not being, um, you know, commercial, but it does exist, it's this audience, but it's sort of this community having a conversation within themselves, which is the counter narrative to the dominant narrative. The dominant narrative informed by the Eurocentric white spaces um, has, holds the power, the prestige, the saleability. And so it's been too long that we'll see artists of color. I worked when I was in uh, college, actually, I worked at a black art gallery in Philadelphia, if anyone's from Philadelphia, October Gallery, James Dupre, a great. Um, and I, you know, and so seeing then that I, I didn't see a lot of white folks coming in, right? And so why, why is it that we are sort of, uh, you know, not able to understand that there could be a standard of beauty, there can be a valid canon of arts and folks that we hold up as the masters, but then there can also be a wide, we can pull that lens back. It can be wider. We have, we can create space and hold space for so much more. It's been so mm -hmm. productive for so long, so limited. When we were talking about the question itself about the white males um, in a field of white males, right? Like one of the things that I just thought of, and again, it's, it's on a tangent, but it's very much re related, right? This idea of representation. What is that impact when we have these two different separate but not equal spaces? There's the white Christmas cards and the black Christmas cards, the white fashion illustration and the tall, skinny, fabulous, um, very, very skinny, fabulous, very skinny, um, fabulous <laughs> white women, <laughs> and then sort of, you know, all the rest. And it start, I, I think about, you know, and this is real, and these connections are real, um, the brown doll versus white doll, which was one of the pivotal, um, aspects to seg to to desegregate schools. I don't know yeah, if folks yeah. are familiar with that as an oh, example, yeah. but for students that were 
um, in black schools as they were making the case for why it was important to seg to desegregate the schools, having the black children be presented with black dolls versus white doll, which doll is nice, which yes. doll is the nice dolly, which doll is the better dolly. That comes from just, they, they perceived even as children that that separate space of a whole other world that was happening in this white space was perceived was perceived as being more prestigious. That's the thing you needed to to, to be sought after, right? So, how many of us generations um, have been trying to um, adapt ourselves to a narrative? How how many of us as generations have been trying to shift our bodies to contort our bodies to fit into um, you know the, the 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 social and beauty constructs that have been represented to us? for so long. And I think it's just an exciting time. And it's just again, why it's so pivotal to have this conversation tonight in this time, in this moment, we have this, like this incredible audacity now where we're just like, why, why? <laughs> like we just, just, all of a sudden somebody woke up, you're like, we actually don't have to do this anymore, right? So we actually can start to, um, you know, like I said, broaden that lens, broaden that field, broaden the possibilities of how we represent and perceive um, beauty and fashion and you know on another panel for another night for the podcast you know redefining fashion right like when we're talking about fashion too that's a whole other two-hour conversation of our, mm -hmm. our relationship to fashion our relationship to media um and you know consuming fashion as an idea and as our relationship to it and to the image hey, i just want to add this one thing i don't think it's an accident that both glenn and i came up in the late 70s Mm -hmm. Because what you saw before that was obviously the civil rights movement. And then you had the black nationalist movement. And so you did have creative people, you know, I, I'm going to say progressive with quotes, who would look at us and look at our work and say, OK, I'm going to let you in. I'm going to let you in. I'm, I'm slightly enlightened and I do like your work and I'm going to bring you in. And I think I think what we're, I think what irritates me now at, at, at my age is that it seems as though and I hate to put it this way, but I'm just going to say it. It does seem as though white America rediscovers racism every decade. So it's like, it's like, oh, oh, there's a problem. Oh, well, let's let's jump on that. So I mean, I, now that I'm this age, I, actually, I I remember this during the '70s. I remember this during the '90s. I remember this. You know, I mean, I can remember um, when I when the very first time I went to Paris. I was Parsons in Paris, and I went there, and I went to the Givenchy show. His cabine was all black. It was all black. Um, and so it's it's not as though this hasn't happened before. It, it does seem as though this time there is some, there's some power behind it. I don't know if that's generational. I don't, I don't know what, what the impetus is, but it does seem heavier. It does seem, I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation means something, but I just want to put out there that we're, we seem to be, <sighs> We're 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 moving along, but it's 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 like two steps backwards and one step forwards. Does that make any sense? We we've done this before. Yeah. Um. And so that's that's why you know I kind of you know I'm not a cynic by any means, but uh, yeah you, you know if you get to my age you're like yeah, well I remember this you know. You know? I'm gonna stick. You know. So anyway. Eric, yeah. Um, really quickly, one more time before we move forward to the next question, would anybody else like to uh, speak on this particular topic? I think we're Can I yes. just? Yes. Yeah. I know you were talking about uh, the question about being in this white male space. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my kind of space was a little after that because then it became uh the white female space mm. and i am for those of you who do not know me i am a six foot two and a half large black man and that's just who i am i've never been apologetic about it i have tried to shrink myself into a certain norm for certain people and it didn't work so i don't try anymore but I, I have been in a situation, one of my first freelance jobs here in New York. I, uh, I think the name of the designer was Charlotte Ford. I think that was her name. And yeah. she was kind of a, a copy of Ralph Lauren. 
And she found out I had freelanced there. And so then she handed me a, a, a page of five women. And she said, they were wearing Ralph Lauren clothes. She said, draw these women, but make them in these fabrics, okay? One, there were three, there were five women, three white. One was the Asian model, Beverly Lee, and one was the black model, Beverly Johnson. And so I drew all the women. Her assistant comes out again, red in the face and says, uh, uh, she wants to see you in her office. And then she looks at me and she goes, these two, change them. They are not my customers. And I'm like, these two what? And it was the black woman and the Asian woman. She said, these two, they are not my customers. So I'm embarrassed. I'm young. I'm like really embarrassed. She said, make them all blonde like that. I was very embarrassed. And then she looks at her assistant and goes, I can't believe he put me in this predicament, this situation. Now, I did what she asked. I was supposed to know right off the bat that all these women meant draw all the white women. I didn't know. So when you talk about like it being an mm. all white male space, I was in a, another situation where a white woman told me, oh, you boys get all the good jobs. So I don't know what you, I said, how many boys that look like me get all the good jobs? And I had, because she, you know, she, she had to come together. Mm. You know, I was like, what's up with that? But anyway, you know, it, that, white aesthetic has been the norm for oh so long that like I said at one time or another we all tried to force ourselves at one way or another into this thing just to either get our foot in the door or stay in the door mm -hmm. I just don't feel like I have to do it anymore you know that's, that's it that's actually a really good point. Also, I really hope that she didn't call you boy, but moving past that. <laughs> Zooming through that. Uh, no, she's uh, still alive. So. Okay. <laughs> um, but just kind of piggybacking off of that, uh, do you feel that there are instances where any of you have felt you had to speak to the entirety of your community or for the entirety of your community? And it, Given yeah. whatever community you identify with, whatever every kind of like background, religious uh, background, I, size I, background. Yes, I, please go ahead. I have a I have a story, um, and I don't want to be you know I don't want this to be a panel where I'm dragging out all this stuff like like you know some sort of therapy session where I'm just vomiting this stuff up. That's <laughs> not what I plan on doing. However, when I was at um, Mademoiselle Magazine. I kind of ask, and if you notice a theme here, so I work at a job and then they disappear after I'm there, they just die. I mean, you know, Mademoiselle Bonwood Teller, you know, Franklin Simon, yeah, they're all dead. Anyway, so um, I was there as a staff illustrator, very lucky, and um, I would be asked to do uh, trend reports. And so they would give me these, these drawings to do, uh, about 30, and there would be a general theme, you know, a concept. And one day, you know, one of the directors comes in and she comes in with a list of themes that were four, and one of them was plantation. And so, I'm, you know, so I get this, and I'm like, oh no, what, what, what am I gonna do? Because I'm low man on the totem pole. I'm not an editor. I'm not even an assistant editor. I'm the illustrator, you know. Um, and so, luckily, there was another black assistant editor, and I went to her. And I showed it to her and she was like, oh no. <laughs> I said, yes, yeah, so what are you gonna do? And she said, I will, we have to talk to them. We have to tell them together. And so we did, we had to go to one of the editors and go, plantation, no, we can't. I mean, plantation brings up, you know, slavery, you know, bad stuff, you know, <laughs> you know with things, you know, not, not pretty fashion stuff. And she got it, she did. Um, but the fact that they were able to come up with that without any association to it. And these are not bad people. You know, I mean, I'm not, it's not like they were, you know, this was deliberate. It was just a lack of consciousness. And of course, by extension, it really meant that there weren't more black people in the decision-making process that would have said, hey, yo, 
that's not good. So, I mean, and, and we do know from recent history in fashion that that's happened again and again and again and again, where people make these mistakes um, because it's a lack of inclusion. Um, and so therefore, uh, they're, they're unconscious or, or uh, you know, even accidental, if you want to use that word, racism, right, you know, comes out and then it's like, oh, my bad. And then, you know, people have to say, well, you know, if, if there was, if there was, if there was more, you know, inclusion, you, you wouldn't have this problem, you know? So anyway, that's, that's my story. I'm sure there's more. <laughs> sure. I would say, I think uh, I could hear you talk throughout the session. Like if only Lamont was talking, I'd be cool with it. Oh, um, <laughs> but, but yes, I think going back to the question, does of course like assume pressure to represent your community, whatever that means, but I think, um, I'm sorry, I'm still like really revved up from the conversation before, but uh, I think for any minority, whether it's religious, race, gender, for us to create work, um, I don't know, but I think most people just are in a perpetual state of anger and it's very difficult to separate that from the joy of just making new stuff. But I think it's been really uh, inspiring to hear all these stories and to know that um, we can use this anger as like fuel to create work that represents us uh, and that's comforting. So I try and not uh, think of representing my entire community because I can't, it's like not possible. Uh, and sometimes I think in that sense, uh, being a little ignorant or a little blinded to everyone's idea of your work or their reaction or anticipating that is just uh, ignorance is bliss in that sense. Uh, and we can just focus on the joy of making. And that's what I think I try to do just to keep myself sane. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's all I wanted to add. Um, I'd like to just uh, also say um, that Lamont made the comment that uh, that they didn't want to see uh, black people as their customer, as their client. Okay, and what I'm really thrilled about is how uh, people like uh, Veronica and, and others are developing their own market and are marketing directly to us. And you'll see that, and I'm sure you see that people are buying because there's a, a craving for imagery that, imagery that reflects us um, from fashion to humor to any number of things. I mean, we really have, things have really changed uh, nowadays and it's buying power. We are the consumer. So uh, doing, looking to move directly to, a, to that, I think is the uh, way to happiness in one's career. Those are all beautiful points. Um, I don't wanna insert myself too much into this just because this isn't, I'm not an illustrator, I'm just kind of more of a student of such uh, kind of thing, but specifically to John Quo, um, can you kind of talk about being or not so much you have to represent us but drawing from the space of a plus size woman and specifically a plus size black woman what it's like to kind of add to the conversation like that way um it's interesting adding to the conversation that way because i felt like we're just recently starting to have this conversation in the first place i don't have a history um in fashion. I didn't even study fashion in school. One of the reasons was is because I did not consider fashion to belong to me. When the fashion students would come down the hallway, I would hear the click clack of their heels and move out the way, <laughs> you know, because I was always frightened of them because I just felt like fashion didn't belong to me. I did not identify with it. I actually fell into it. Um, Veronica mentioned these, uh, this earlier uh, was with the influencers. I became friends with a lot of fashion influencers in New York, specifically the ones who were plus size, 
who were like making these waves talking about this industry saying, hey, you're li leaving us out. I specifically draw um, plus size women, primarily of color, and the media would normally identify this type of woman historically as a mammy. And I draw, and I know that's a loaded thing to say, but that's how they would look at us. I draw these women as desirable, as if we are the target customer, because we are. We have the biggest buying power. Every single brand that you look at right now that is popular, whether it's like a Fashion Nova or a brand like that, had to introduce Curve because they realized that we had buying power um, in a lot of ways. Uh, we were spending the most money. So I try and, uh, to introduce us like, hey, we are luxurious, we are worth looking at. And it's weird that I constantly have to have this conversation over and over and over again, when you know for a fact that you're selling to us. Um, so that is my challenge. I constantly have to have this discussion and bring up the fact and I'm lucky enough that I have been able to build up my own brand through my following. Like I don't have to work with a corporate company. Corporate companies actually come to me because I have a following. I manufacture my own products and I sell to people. I don't have to worry about seeing a Christmas card out there with a black woman with a figure because I can manufacture my own because I speak directly to my audience and they speak directly to me. I can't tell you the amount of letters uh, that I get every day of people telling me thank you for finally seeing me, for showing me um, in a way that nobody else is because we matter. And I, I feel like we have to constantly remind people that we're here, we exist, we have the money, and we matter. I constantly have to have this conversation. So thank you for asking me. <laughs> Wait, sorry. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I feel you. Um, yeah. Really quickly, before we move on to the third one, would any of the other panelists like to say anything regarding this matter? Okay. Um, you know, I guess to, again, to sort of connect some of the threads, you know, I guess I will also just reference for, for Lamont and this idea of the plantation. It was only just a couple of years ago, I think, that we were still seeing um, plantations being held as sites for weddings um, and events. And again, is it intentional or is it a malicious, aggressive act per se? But it is that lack of our ability to be cross-sharing experiences it's that lack of, as Lamont said, sort of, you know, who is the, the people of color, the different diverse thoughts and experiences and histories, the perception of a plantation for one person who might see it as the architectural space that would be, you know, this place of a fantasy for a wedding. For another person, it holds immense generational trauma. So this importance of like, who gets to now tell this story? Um, I guess, you know, some of the work that I do um, as part of research with community um, is I have a workshop around fashion and identity with young Muslim women. Um, and one of the things that we talk about is, you know, how have you been perceived, Muslim women been perceived? From a few years ago, the initial research started because I did a quick Google search, Muslim woman, and a quick Google search reflected that they were all wearing head to toe black burqa. There was no, there was no differentiation. It was just a big sea of all these, um, you know, and unrecognizable images of all these women wearing up head to toe, black and white burqa, you might get a couple eyes peeking through. That didn't represent me. That didn't represent the women that I know, um, all of my cousins and my family. So, you know, the, the to, to you can't underestimate the power of the pen. You can't underestimate that power where you start to take control of the narrative and you have the agency to tell your own story, just like you were just saying, right? Like you don't have to wait now for the middleman and the corporations, um, you know, to come and say, you get to have that direct um, experience to, to tell that story through illustration, through the image. Um, I think about even growing up, you know, being bicultural and going back and forth to Egypt, you know, again, a history of colonization where people, where there's a different language, a different culture. And up until now, you will go to Egypt and the billboards will all show images of beautiful white women and they will hold all the magazines, the fashion magazines, all of it, it will always be beautiful white women. It is extraordinarily rare to see an Egyptian woman um, to be my actual complexion, which I'm 
guessing might be closer to the actual Egyptian <laughs> color, I, I suspect, but I never saw myself represented. This was a shock to me to see all these blonde hair women with blue eyes on these billboards and in fashion magazines and in the movies. Um, and so, you know, that is still real. So the, the shift that we're seeing where people say, um, we're actually, you know, how do we, what, how do we process this Eurocentric image that is so ubiquitous. It is around us. We can't escape it. It is through TV and film and through fashion. Um, you know, do we adapt to it? I, I did, right? I think about if I had seen the women that I see now on TikTok, fierce hijabistas. I mean, fierce. So I see those women now and they have a different, a, a different understanding of their own sexuality, their own body. They see their hair as an aspect of sexuality and they would rather have that be covered and imagine you know imagine like how courageous that is you know i go back to the time of when algeria you know when the french came through algeria the french actually went through the capital of algeria ripping the veils off of the women announcing to them that they've now been freed you're free you're free from being muslim and so you know the idea we still have that right so for me growing up in egypt my mother's generation you know the idea of modernity the idea of freedom the idea of you know forward thinking was that you've shed the veil, you shed any vestiges of looking what the indigenous people would have looked like, so that you can adapt to this image. And like I said, I mean, I'm just kind of you know these are all all these stories keep connecting to again too. We want to hold and have that balance for holding and respecting the greats and the canon that has been established, the masters. The fact that it's taken so long, I think, for the conversation to get to the point where we understand fashion illustration as a high art form and respect it for what it is. But then also too, we wanna hold space because it's a language and language is fluid and it evolves. So I'm just loving watching it just like, you know, explode open to evolve um, for all this other new rich um, language. Christiana, can I jump in really quickly? Totally fine. I think I, to think about the this particular question, what I've realized in um, in recent years is that part of your having to educate somebody is going to happen. Like it's just it's just going to happen when you live in an identity that's underrepresented. And what I've learned is like the the choice then to make is: Am I going to take on this responsibility of having to educate somebody when they've messed up, you know, like Lamont did, is I had a similar um, experience at work earlier this year where I had to stop somebody and tell them that what they did was insensitive in terms of, you know, race at work. Um, so you have to, there's a point where you have to decide, are you gonna take on that role? And what, if you take on that role or if you don't take on that, that task, what are the end effects of that after that? Right. So as painful as it was for me earlier this year to have to have a conversation with upper management about a thing that happened at work, I had to think about the fact that I knew if I didn't say something, I would be harming myself and trying to continue to work in a place where nobody was where I, I didn't speak up about my pain. Right. If you don't speak up about it, you're just going to like kind of sit and stew in it. So there was that it would have taken me out of my work. And that's affecting me directly and what I love to do. The second part about it is that I have a black girl who works directly under me and I had to speak up for her because it's her first job. And like Lamont, like you said, you kind of know when you don't have the seniority to speak up about something that's harmful, you know? And so I, I do think that all of us are going to be faced with that at some point. And we have to kind of, we have to use that righteous anger, you know, like as mentioned before, but understanding that at some point we're gonna to have to educate somebody, whether it's through a direct conversation or whether it is through just doing our own art and putting it out there and proving these people wrong about their assumptions. Um, and taking that power back and saying, okay, if I have to take on this role as an educator in these issues, how much am I willing to do that? And how am I gonna do that, right? In a way that serves me. I go to work to paint. I don't go to work to be, you know, the race whisper and I made that yeah. very clear when I had that conversation. I said, I don't want to be sitting here having this conversation with you. I want to paint, you know? So I, 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 I hear these stories and I know it's easy. I know that they kind of inspire like annoyance and anger and they should, 
But I do think part of the reality is that that's a thing that we're going to have to do at some point in time. And so just taking the agency and saying, how am I going to do it? How am I going to approach it? Can I say something? Mm -hmm. I think two things going on. First, as an artist, all right, first, all artists is personal propaganda. It is. We're saying, this is our point of view. Please accept it. Please embrace it. You know, see it my way, essentially. So in one sense, you're already making a statement just by creating. That's, that's off to the side. You're an artist, that's, that comes with the territory. The other thing is your personal relationship within a, within a corporate structure, which is, you know, um, you choose your battles. We have all, we have all said, I'm gonna say something here. I'm not gonna say something here. I'll let that one slide and see if they do it again. I'm gonna, yeah, you, we all, and I don't think that's unique to being a black person either. I, I'm sure there, there, are, there are people, we're, we're talking about people with power and people without, and how you navigate them. And, you know, you know, who can you risk confronting and saying and hoping for some sort of resolution? And who will, you, will, you know, get in the place and have you fired? You know, so, I mean, this is, this is just reality. But I think as you grow, as you, as you learn and experience, you pick your battles. And it, as long as you're able to express yourself, and you found a great way to do that, all of us have. Um, then I think you can always take solace in the fact that what's in here is of paramount importance and you protect that. You just do, you know. Um, you, I don't think you can be a successful artist, uh, an artist of any note, commercial or otherwise, without um, taking seriously what's in here and protecting it. You know, and that's rule number one. I can be, you know, I, I, I'm really like a really soft nerd. I really, really am. I'm incredibly blobby, except when it comes to my work and myself and that part of me. That I protect with armor and shield. And I think every artist has to do that. Otherwise, they're squashed by an indifferent world, you know, regardless of race. So anyway, that's just... No, thank you. Um, just kind of that whole, like, kind of emotional labor that you all have to take on dealing with those kinds of inst instances is I don't want to do it. Uh, <laughs> and I'm so glad that I'm not suited to do that, which is why I choose not to. Um, just really quickly, uh, I want to go to our last question because I'm pretty sure that a lot of our audience would probably like to ask any questions or maybe you want to uh, speak up on this particular issue. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. My final question I want to ask you guys is, um, given what we're talking about, um, compensation is going to have to come up. Um, how do you think we can properly ensure everyone is compensated fairly and equitably without discussing payment? Because I know in a lot of spaces, a lot of people don't like to talk about money, um, of, of specifically uh, between like, well, how much did you get? How much did you get? That kind of thing. Um, and then also, is there a way to even be able to discuss this without risking your relationships with people? I would love to talk about this. Um, you have to talk to people. You have to. And this is why making connections like these is it's so important because now, you know, I can reach out to someone said, hey, you know, we chatted on this panel. I got offered, you know, this job for something I think you're experienced in doing. What might be the range for that? I've done that with other illustrators who I only know through the Internet and they've been generally, generally really open about this is what your range should be. Um, there's no way you can survive without doing that. I don't feel like, because otherwise you're just setting yourself up to be exploited and companies will try to exploit you. Customers will try to exploit you, which has also happened, you know? So these, you, you got to put a dollar amount on it. You have to. Um, cause also the other, the other danger is, and I, I've done this admittedly in earlier years where you kind of put too much of a value on what you're offering and you're pricing people out of ever hiring you, right? So pricing is a, is a, Jessica Hish says, pricing is a dark art, you know? And the only way that you can kind of wrap your head around it is having those conversations, um, making sure you're talking to the correct people about it, right? Not going to say uh, someone who's experienced in say advertising, and trying to ask about how much a picture book would cost, right? 
or not going someone who's experienced in one thing, but asking about how much licensing for greeting cards would cost. Um, Cause it's wildly different. It is wildly different across the spectrum. Um, so that's really important. I feel like these connections are important. Um, talking to people who have worked previously with other companies. I have a little group text with other black girl illustrators where we talk about companies straight up. They offered me this and I didn't take it. I don't think you should offer, y'all don't think you should take it either. You know, um, there's no way of getting around it if you want to make a living out of this, if you want to support yourself out of this. The biggest thing that has helped me is getting an agent in picture book illustration because she will look at a request that comes in and I'm like, oh, that sounds like good money. And she says, absolutely not. This is not worth your time. You're worth more than this. White woman, you're worth more than this. She looks out. So you got to find that tribe that looks out for you. You got to find the experts that know what you're doing out for you. And you have to talk about it. It's hard to talk about publicly, but you have to talk about it with somebody. Um, I'd like to jump in on this too, because uh, getting the right amount of money for your um, work is really a challenge. It's a lifelong challenge, whether you're, in my case, a fashion illustrator or a fine artist. Uh, getting the right amount of money, uh, what makes you feel happy um, and, and willing to part with something is another, um, it's another thing. But I remember early on when I first uh, was coming out of Parsons, I met this fashion illustrator. Her name was Dora. She was very well known. And I asked her, how do I charge for my projects? And she said to me, you ask them what their budget is. Then you ask for twice as much and you accept 50% less. And I, from that point on, I was always you know, at least I had a ballpark. Start with, what do you want to pay? Oh, that's not enough. And, you know, you can negotiate from there. Christiana? Hi, everyone. This is Karen again. Um, I just want to let everyone know we're at the, almost the 10 minute mark before we conclude, which is stunning to me how quickly the time has passed mm -hmm. and how engaging this has been for me as an onlooker and listener. Um, I just want to open up the floor to see if anyone has any questions at this point, just to give enough time for that kind of discourse. I have a question. Okie dokie. <laughs> Hi, my name is, well, you see my name. Um, I, my main question is dealing with connection within the community of illustrators, um, especially illustrators of color. I was trying to, um, I'd like to know how we can go about, or if we want to in the first place, but how we can go about creating our own community um, where we can, like, can we create a guild of sorts um, to be able to communicate with each other and like, you know, uh, not Christiana, but um, I can't remember who was speaking when she was saying she has a, a text group of different illustrators that she talks to. I'm not uh, familiar with a lot of illustrators. This is the most illustrators I've seen in my life all in one sitting and, um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm i'm ecstatic but i would love to be in contact with all of you guys more and um you know see what about job openings get uh tips on on how to price how to um how to go about finding an agency and different things of that matter um, i would like to point out that uh josh joe put a link in the discussion side uh mm -hmm. for let me see sorry uh, yeah, it's a website called lightbox.info. It's a group of illustrators who basically just started putting down rates of what they were getting paid uh, to check in with other people and just have conversations around pricing uh, and for it to not be this silent thing that no one talks about, which is what I experienced when I uh, started working in the US. Uh, so that's a small resource, uh, but again, like echoing what Veronica said earlier, you just have to talk to people um, and it can become a really good starting point for you to build those connections within the industry uh, where you start talking about pricing, you start talking about how companies treat employees, uh, contracts and all kinds of stuff. So I think this website is just one of those sources where uh, people are starting to talk about transparency in different parts of being an illustrator, especially freelance illustration. Um, so yeah, that's a starting point. 
I hope you find it helpful. Any other questions? I oh, didn't question. answer uh, Jerry's question. <laughs> oh, okay. I have found, honestly, and I, I, your mileage may vary on this, but I have found a really engaged Facebook group to be very powerful in connecting people. Um, it, 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 I'm one of the person who saves like the text messages for like, you know, my, my mom and my cat, right? You know, like <laughs> that's, who, that's who it's for. But I have found a lot of power in um, Facebook groups specifically because of the way the platform facilitates group discussion. It's not like Twitter where you get like a constant feed and things get lost. And it's not like Instagram. It, it has a very specific group function. So um, that is one way I think of doing it. Um, the agency I'm with, we have a Facebook group for um, everyone who is a client of the agency. And we talk about books and pricing and stuff. Um, there's, there's uh, if you ever take, I've taken a lot of online courses like professional development courses. A lot of them will have a Facebook group that continue to serve you. Um, after the course is wrapped. Um, what else? Um, I mean, it's worth exploring if you could build one or seeing what's out there. I haven't really looked for a general black illustrators group, but I think it's because I'm in a different position of I have a circle already, right? And you're trying to build a circle. Um, I have found, is it fashion illustration that you're interested in specifically? Yes, um, I actually have been certified by the CFDA as an expert in the field of fashion illustration. <laughs> um, I was actually um, when, they, when, they, when they first started that certification, I was one of the first students. Well, I was a student at the time to be awarded. Um, that was back in 2013. That was a long time ago. And, and since then, they were saying, you know, hey, reach out to us if you ever need help with anything, which I did. And I wouldn't get a lot of uh, a lot of help back. Like, you know, they would just be like, oh, draw every day. You know, just draw, <laughs> just draw every day. Yeah. And, <laughs> and put it up yeah. on your um, on your social media sites and you should be good to go. You know, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, didn't really help a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would like obviously um, there's to my knowledge, there's no guild of fashion illustrators that's as big as the CFDA. But it would be great if there were, especially if especially if there was one of color um, to be included in and to interact with. So that's pretty much what I'm looking for is just sort of um, just like a strong group that mm -hmm. we have a community and rally behind each other and help each other. I do mm -hmm. want to say uh, really quickly to that, you should probably drop your IG handle in the... Yeah, do yeah. that. Mm -hmm. also, yeah. Do that. Also, <laughs> who's to say that you can't create the guild yourself because there are so many, mm -hmm. there are a lot of... Yeah, uh, right. It's kind of with everything that was happening this summer with all of the unjust murders and all of that. Um, a lot of Black historians, fashion designers, um, and that kind of thing, they created their own kind of guild. Um, and I can't... I think it's called the Kelly Initiative. Um, and they uh, are trying to better control the narrative because all a lot of us not just specifically speaking to black people but anybody who's marginalized were other for a greater amount of media um so they're trying to help kind of uh raise our voices in that realm i think maybe uh again us speaking on this kind of thing this isn't my again i'm not an illustrator but i think it would be probably apropos for you to maybe see if you can start or even see what they're doing because maybe they also need somebody to speak about uh, like fashion mm -hmm. illustration in that way, specifically to people of color, because like we need more voices, honestly, in all realms. Uh, and we have to start kind of lifting ourselves up. But if there's a, an area that you can work in yourself and you think it would be uh, the person to do it, I think you should do it. Yeah, I, I was gonna. I was gonna say too. There's a lot of, um, in general, a lot of disparate groups that have already formed, probably to solve the problem that you're looking to solve. It's a, mat a matter of getting people to connect. Um, and I think it's more powerful to bring those together than everyone. Everyone kind of starting their own thing. Um, when when the world was open up and it was safe to travel, I was on the board for something called the Illustration Conference, which didn't have a lot of representation from the fashion illustration world. And I was trying to bring that into our conferences and stuff. 
Um, so also a thing to keep in mind is when things are safe, or even now when there's like digital programming um, available, looking at different organizations that already actually exist and something like this, looking at their programming, who they have to come speak, um, looking at traveling to their conferences when it's safe to do so again. Um, it's it, A lot of it is is the old school, you know, actually networking. Um, Cause sometimes, sometimes I find without a true personal connection, like we're having now, it's really hard to get connected to people. So I think the, the biggest trick is getting connected personally first and then building from there. Christiana, um, I want to give Ashley an opportunity cause she had a question and this will be our final question for the evening. Great. Thank you. Um, my question was for, I guess, anyone who promotes their stuff on social media, because I find that like as a student, it's like really hard for me to find a space to show my work without worrying about um, other people using it. And um, like, I know some people do it out of like support, trying to repost you without tagging or mm -hmm. just like other students ending up taking your ideas for school projects. Like I come across that problem a lot. So I just wanted to know if anyone had any tips for that. Okay, me, I can jump right in for this one. Um, yes, jump I you. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually had my work actually stolen by a few companies um, in China before, actually six different times. And I had to write cease and desist letters to get them to remove my work from their websites. Uh, but when you're sharing stuff, understand, first of all, that your work, when you create it, from the time you create it, it's already copywritten. It's already copyrighted. And you can go even further in getting like an official copyright, but sometimes it takes a long time. But I do not want you to be afraid to post your art online because that is the way that we communicate now. That's how we build our network and start our groups and attract corporate attention. You have to use social media. It is free marketing. Please use it to your advantage and build your brand while you're still in school. Start that now. Well, I I will suggest is maybe putting watermarks on your work for one and not covering the whole work, but maybe like a light watermark, making sure all of your signature is always visible. And as you start to build your work, people will recognize your stuff. So even when somebody reposts, they will automatically recognize, oh, that's Ashley's work because you'll start to build your brand. But don't hold back. Don't have fear. You have to post. That is the way this world, especially during COVID, um, that is the way that we communicate with each other. Um, just focus on building that brand, engaging with your audience, post as much as you can, make sure you're using all of them. Make sure you're using Twitter, Facebook, IG, and TikTok to your advantage. That is how we build our brand. Um, and I so said, just make sure you put that, um, make sure that you put that watermark. Also keep in mind that when you are manifesting that you are going to be a big name. So there's going to be no stopping people from seeing your work. The same way that they'll take a, a Gucci or Dior symbol and slap it on a bag, that's how they're going to be with your work because you're going to be that big. So get used to it. Get used to the repost. So that's the only thing I have to say on that subject matter. They, yeah, they, they, can, they can copy you, but they can't do what you do. They yeah. can't do what you do. They cannot do what you do. And as you start to post, you'll get an audience that will recognize your work and they'll recognize when somebody else took it. And also, um, if you, I know that everybody was talking about pricing. If you guys don't know about the price, the ethical and pricing guidelines book, that book not only lists current um, pricing for what's going on in the industry, but they have an entire legal section in the back that contains like a cease and desist letter that you can type up and you can send out, or you can always go to an art lawyer. New York has a great um, non-for-profit section that, um, that takes care of artists that you can go and you can contact them and have you draw up contracts. So if somebody does steal your work, you can, if it, if especially if it's a bigger company, you can email them a cease and desist letter. It would be uh, great to entertain. So oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Lamar. No, that's okay. I'm going to chat. I'm just. Gonna, I just want to make the point that the 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 group that you were mentioning is it's the Graphic Artists Guild, um, and um, they have a book that they come out. I think every year, or every five years, and it lists everything: um, fashion illustration, illustration, medical illustration, t printing T-shirts, advertising, you name it, and they give you a list of the prices. Um, now that's, you know, you got to fudge that somewhat because some of them are a little unrealistic, but basically um, it, it's what you describe. I'm just going to write it here in the chat section. 
Great. Um, I just want to thank you, Christiana, for the germ of this idea um, for this panel discussion. It's been such a delight. Um, and I cannot believe how quickly an hour and a half goes by. Same. Uh, but you've, you've all made it such a joy. Um, and uh, I've put my uh, email address in the chat, but I'll put it there again in case anybody wants to get in touch with me to continue this conversation. Um, and with that, I'm going to say good night for now, but not goodbye. So thank you all so very, very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you.